to a certain spot in time and place. A place where torches could be seen, guards and people shouting, the anxiety and frenzy of what was about to happen. A garden and a room in Israel, inside and out of Jerusalem. We will wind the night backwards and then continue in real time at the end. We will start in a garden, but not just any garden, the garden of Gethsemane. It is situated outside the holy city gates, down through the Kindred Valley, and up along a steep hill towards the very top of the Mount of Olives. The very spot that Jesus spent a lot of solitude and time. It was just down from the main thoroughfare, the road that led from Bethany, and the main road to the north. The one that pilgrims and merchants traveled heavily. Jesus himself came past the spot numerous times, looking down at the olive grove, thinking. Now the night had come. Here he was in the same garden, and yet again, only not alone. No, this time he brought his three closest friends, John, James, and Peter. They came with him to sit and to provide some comfort. Well, it must have been extremely painful to offer grace knowing that all of the wine from the night's festivities was catching up to them and they could not keep their eyes open. All they could do was sleep. They could not stay awake and pray or offer comfort as he poured his heart out. The spirit was willing, but oh, the flesh so weak. In the olive grove, is an olive press. The olives are picked and laid in a, in a carved stone where a millstone is rolled over the top, mashing the olives. They are oily, yet no oil has really been released just yet. The pulp is picked up and it's laid in special baskets. And next, those baskets are laid on top of one another. And just the mere weight from the mashed olives is enough to release the oil. It drips down into about a one and a half foot hole where the water is heavier and falls to the bottom and the oil rises to the top. So it can be dipped out. This first pressing is the best. It's the purest oil. It's called the first fruits. And the first fruits are reserved for God and the temple. This oil is used to light the menorahs and for anointing kings. It is the oil that was used by Mary to anoint Jesus' feet and usher him in as the king and high priest just the Sunday before. Next, those olives are then pressed with an arm that holds weight on the end, squeezing the oil that's still in the mash. This is called the second, more stenous pressing. It is used for cooking and cosmetics and perfumes. And finally, more weight is ratcheted down on the mash of olives, crushing it beyond. This third and last pressing is the final stage that releases the last little bit of oil the olive may possess. Then the olive, when the olive gives no more, then the mash is taken out of those baskets. And what little bit of oily residue is left on the olives will make for good fire starters. I'm going to teach you some Hebrew tonight. Can you say got? Got. Got. Can you say shemen? Shemen. Now put it together. Got. got. Shemen. Got means press, and shemen means oil. Together, got. Get shemen. Gethsemane means oil press. The crushing and the pouring out. When Jesus went there that last night to pray, how many times? Three times. Three times the pressure increased and he was crushed for our iniquities. Three times he was crushed to the extent that his sweat became like blood. He had given all that was left. Before the garden, he had given final instructions and teachings. 
to his disciples, preparing them for what was about to happen. But they still were not getting it. Maybe because of the late night, maybe because of the festivities, and maybe because of some of the wine. But they were more interested in when Jesus would come back and take over and conquer and release captives. They wanted to know about the last days, when the end would be. Not soaking in what was about to happen immediately. Prior to their wandering out of the city, Jesus had just sat with them, dining and relaxing and sharing his Passover meal with those who would desert him, deny him, those who would fall asleep, and the one who was about to betray him. This room is on an upper story, just actually adjacent to where they believe the King David's tomb is at. The details. Two kings of Israel right beside each other. Now this room was pre-orchestrated by God. A room was needed not just for that one night celebrations, but for a refuge for the huddled masses for weeks waiting. A place where Jesus could return and meet them, not once, but twice. And finally a place where they could stay and wait until the gift of the Holy Spirit would come and ignite each this room, this place, a special place, is where they congregated to sit down together in joy and fellowship. A night of celebrating the same Passover meal that had been happening in home since the Exodus. The meal that every year for millennial, the middle matzo bread, was wrapped and raised and represented the coming Messiah by every awaiting Jew. This night, however, Jesus lifted up that afikoman, that middle piece, and he said, I am here. This is me. This is my body that is broken for all. It was a solidification of everything the disciples had heard and seen and knew up to this point. The final visual of Yehoshua, the long-awaited Messiah, then at the appointed time, he lifted up the third cup of wine, the cup of redemption from the covenant with Moses, the Israelites, and God. He raised it up and he said, you know what was spoken through the prophets of the covenant. This will now be transformed into a new covenant. It will be myself, the Messiah, and you. It will be my blood which will be poured out for the forgiveness of all. With this sacrifice, the forgiveness of all sin will be cleansed until I drink it again anew. I am sure that the solemnness of the atmosphere was one that was tangible. It had to have caused a little bewilderment, an uncomfortable edge, one of flight or fight, fight or flight, especially for one such man. And Jesus looked at Judas and said, go and do what you need to. Even being caught red-handed, Judas did not deny it. He did not stay and pretend that nothing Something in him, someone in him, raised his form and ushered him out of the room. Did Judas really know that there was no turning back from what he would, from what the results from his actions would be? What was really in it for him? Or was he just a pawn? Thirty pieces of silver. That may seem odd, however, God is in the details. It's called the pit yon yon. It is a redemptive price. When the firstborn male was taken on the eighth day to be circumcised, a redemptive price was offered to redeem that child from the priest back into the home of the parents. The only way the high priest could claim and own Jesus was to give back the redemptive price that, they had, that had been paid by his parents over 33 years prior. The price had to be paid even without them realizing what they were doing. And Judas was all too eager, the recipient. I want you to transport yourself back to that time, that night. I want you to hear the sounds. I want you to smell the smells. I want you to see the light flickering from the room. As the disciples sat with 
their Messiah, their friend, Jesus. As he blessed and he broke that bread, they may not have got it fully, but they knew it was monumental. He lifted it up and he blessed it and he said, this is my body broken for you. Every time you eat of this, do this in remembrance of me. And then he picked up that cup. The cup of redemption. He said, this is now going to be a new covenant, a covenant between myself and you. It's going to be my blood which will be poured out for the forgiveness of all sin. Every time you drink of this, do this in remembrance of me. That forgiveness extends and cleanses over all sin, including Peter's denial, and even including the betrayal of Judas. In the creation, God brought man into a garden. When? On the sixth day. In Hebrew, the sixth day begins Thursday night. In the new creation, Messiah suffered and died to redeem us. And how did it all begin? It began in a garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. When the temple guards came to take him away to be executed. As God in the creation, God brought man into a garden. And so in the redemption, man took God out of the garden. In Genesis, it all happened on the sixth day. So in redemption, Messiah was removed from the garden Thursday night, the Hebrew sixth day. And on the sixth day, God brought man into a garden to bless him and to make him rejoice. And on the sixth day again, man took God out of a garden to curse him and to make him suffer. And why did God allow it? Because of you. God allowed himself to be taken out of the garden to die, that you might be brought into a garden of blessing to live. to the Monday, Thursday service last night. We're going to continue. It's going to be a little different service. I want you just to sit back. I want you to listen to the sounds. I want you to imagine yourself in the place. We're going to recreate the night in which Jesus spent that last evening with his disciples. So last night we left Jesus and his disciples on the Mount of Olives the crowd was bearing down and fast. Judas was carrying the 30 pieces of silver. The Sanhedrin had 200 Roman guards, plus a large company that followed. It is guesstimated that up to 700 people possibly came out to join in on the arrest of this troublemaker. Jesus is betrayed by one of his very inner circle, with a kiss, no less. The sting that must have pierced his heart. The crowd grabbed Jesus on top of that high hill of the Mount of Olives and marched him back down that extremely steep and long winding path down to the side of the Mount of Olives, into the Kidron Valley, and back up through Jerusalem. Jesus would have seen David's citadel to his left, and the once rightful ruler of Israel, now knowing that his kinship would soon be mocked. Even David's palace now lay in Herod's custody as he claimed it for himself. The well-worn stones beneath his feet held such a treasure of history and yet they would soon be immortalized for a millennium. Jesus was led through the streets, another uphill climb to Caiaphas' home, the chief priest. 
The Pharisees and Sanhedrin had waited and maneuvered so long for this chance to rid themselves of this menace. As they crested the high hill, the glow of the lamps illuminating Caiaphas' residence loomed in the distance. The disciples trailed a little farther back, wanting to be in the mix, but wanting to save their friend, and yet afraid for their very own lives. Peter had already tried when he grabbed the sword earlier and cut the ear off of Malichus' high priest's servant. Instead of everyone else seizing the opportunity, or Jesus being grateful for his actions, he was reprimanded, and the ear healed right in front of his eyes. Jesus was shoved into a room where the midnight circus court had been formed. Nothing about this was legal. No one could have tried, been tried immediately. Two, it could not be done at night. And three, there needed to be credible witnesses, none of which took place. They chided him, scolded him, and when he could not even get a enough false witness to condemn Jesus. In desperation, the high priest addressed him, saying, You answer nothing? Look at what they are accusing you of. Jesus, however, did not answer until the high priest said, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus responded, You have said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming in the clouds of heaven. At this, the high priest ripped his clothes and screamed blasphemy. Contrary to both Jewish and Roman law, they abused him. They roughly tightened a blindfold around his head and spat in his face. Another slapped him on his head. Then the high priest walked counterclockwise, hitting Jesus with the palm of his hand, blow after blow. Prophesy to us, if you are the Son of God. Tell us who is hitting you. Little did they know that the very act they were doing was orchestrated by God. Yes, before the sacrifice could be lifted up by the priest to be a replacement for the people's sin. He first had to lay his hands on the head of the sacrifice, or it didn't count. There had to be a transference of sin, and by circling Jesus and laying their hands on his head, they were enacting the transference of their sins and the world's onto the sacrifice that stood before them. Peter, who had followed Jesus into the high priest's court, sat at a safe distance and had gone to sit with the guards, hoping that no one would notice. Unbelievable regret was about to set in as events quickly unfolded. Peter found himself doing the very thing that he said he would never do. And that was to deny his Lord and Savior. Not once, or twice, but three times. And then, the cock crowed. Signifying dawn. As the sun started to peek through the horizon, the group grabbed Jesus and pushed him down the hill through the streets and to Pilate's quarters in Jerusalem. Now Pilate's wife had been troubled with horrible dreams about this man and tried to warn her husband. But what could he, the governor of Judea, act upon based on a dream? Jesus was thrust at him, and the raging mob demanded that he be questioned and tried by Pilate. With discretion, Pilate took Jesus in and began to question him, to which he remained silent, not wanting to cause a riot. He realized that Jesus was from Nazareth and subject to Herod, who was legally in charge of this man and just so happened to be in town celebrating in his palace in the southeast side of town in the city of David. Jesus was pushed down the streets and up the hill to Herod's quarters where the king of the Jews awaited anxiously to have this man from Galilee dazzle him with miracles and wonders he had waited so long to meet. Jesus, however, did not join in. 
He just stood there as Herod became more and more impatient. Finally, he said, I'm tired and done with this man. He is nothing. Send him back to Pilate. The Roman guards grabbed Jesus and ushered him out of the palace, back through the winding roads that lead uphill, through the gate of Jerusalem, continuing up the hill and arriving back at Pilate's residence. Pilate told the high priest to judge him themselves, but they said, we have no right to execute anyone. Pilate then went back inside the palace. He summoned Jesus and he asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Is this your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it that you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. Oh, so you are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And what is the truth? retorted Pilate. With this he went out against the Jews gathered there and said, I find no basis for charge against him. But it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had been taking part in an uprising, in an insurrection against Rome. This was the very first time that two criminals had been brought before the Jews to choose. Yet there had to be two. Two identical specimens to make the sacrifice complete. During Yom Kippur, it is the Day of Atonement, the holiest day of all year. The day that all sin would be forgiven for that day in time. And two identical goats were chosen and brought before the high priest who would then reach into an urn and pull out two lots. Two goats. Two lots. One stone identified the goat that would die as a sacrifice for sins of the people, and the other identified the goat that would be led into the wilderness, the scapegoat. So before there could be a sacrifice, there had to be a presentation of the two goats before the people and the choosing. Two had to be presented, and there had to be two men for the people. Jesus the Messiah was the Son of God or the Son of the Father. And Jesus Barabbas, that was his name, was the prisoner. Not a coincidence. Barabbas literally means in Hebrew, Bar is son, and Abba is father. The son of the father. Both had to be identical in some way. One to be sacrificed and one to to be set free as a scapegoat. Pilate took Jesus and said, What would you have me do with your Jesus of Nazareth? Crucify him! The elders stirred the crowd into a frenzy. Pilate again tried to reason and ask what this man has done to deserve that. But the crowd was insistent, and for fear of a riot, he made a public display of the fact that this man's blood be on them. And he ceremoniously washed his hands of the situation. Pilate then led Jesus off with the soldiers to be flogged and crucified. The soldiers beat him to a pulp and then mocked him by fashioning a crown of thorns, shoving it down on his head, piercing his skin, and draping a scarlet robe while mocking him as king of the Jews. There was a reason that Christ had to wear the crown of thorns. It was not happenstance. The crown was a symbol of royalty, power, and kingship. But the thorns were a sign of the curse, a fallen world and thistles. 
Thorns bring pain, piercing blood, tears, and destruction. Jesus became the king of the thorns, the king of the curse. The thorns are linked to the curse, and the curse is linked to death. So the crown of thorn ordains that Messiah will die. He will bear the weight of the curse upon his head, and he becomes the king of the curse and the king of the cursed. King of the broken, king of the pierced and wounded, and king of the rejected. Jesus then was made to carry his cross beam from there. They had beat him down the streets, down to the bottom of the Kindred Valley, and back up to the top of the Mount of Olives. The physical strain was too much for one in that condition, and God sent him help, a man by the name of Simon of Cyrene, to carry the burden for him. There has been discrepancies as to where the exact location of the crucifixion and the tomb lie. But I will pose another, more probable one. The top of the Mount of Olives. It had to be outside the city walls on a hill. The main road to the east of the Mount of Olives was traveled by all coming into the city. And it's called Golgotha, the place of the skull. Not because it looks like a skull, not because people die there, but because a very important and famous skull was buried there by King David. Goliath's skull. That is right. Goliath's skull is buried on that high hill, the same hill that Solomon then built temples to his wife's pagan gods, the very spot where Jesus, I propose, was nailed to the cross beam. along with two other criminals. And like Moses, raised the serpent in the wilderness for all to gaze upon to be saved. So the Son of Man was raised up on a cross for all to see and be saved if they accepted him. There's another miracle here, one that gets overlooked. The miracle of time. All of this, from Caiaphas' home till now, all took place by 9 a.m. I've been there. It would be extremely impossible to do all of this just retracing the steps, let alone the beating, the cross-carrying, on such horrific terrain. God had to have slowed or stopped time, because Jesus had to have that first nail driven on or before 9 a.m., there was yet two crucial things to still fulfill. Jesus had to become the asham, which means guilt offering. It also means guilt. Guilt offering and the guilt, almost contradictory. The guilt offering could only take away the guilt of the one offering it by first becoming the guilt. In Isaiah 53, it is not talking about an animal sacrifice, but of a human life, the Messiah. Messiah is the Asham. It means that he not only dies to take away our guilt, but he becomes the guilt itself. So when you see Jesus on the cross, you're seeing the Asham, the sacrifice, but also the guilt. Your guilt being nailed to the cross. Pilate made one final statement that infuriated Jesus' accusers. He had King of the Jews nailed above his head in three different languages. And now, to the mystery of time and the time. There are always two unblemished lambs brought from Bethlehem to the temple to be used as the day's sacrifices. One to be offered in the morning to start the day, and the other at the end of the day to finish the ceremonies. The morning lamb would be offered as the beginning sacrifice at the third hour of the day. When it's death, with its death, the trumpets, the shofar, would sound. And the temple gates would be opened. 
Then at the ninth hour, the evening sacrifice would be slain and offered at the altar, and the shofar would blow, at which all time, all sacrifices would finish. The third hour is 9 a.m. The evening ninth hour is 3 p.m. Jesus was crucified at 9 a.m. and died at 3. Jesus had to endure hanging on the cross for the entire duration to be the atonement and the beginning and the ending sacrifice. I can hear the shofar in the distance as the last nail is being driven and the pole placed in the prepared hole, raising our Lord and Savior for all to see. Another interesting tidbit. There were actually four holes to crucify prisoners. But this day, only three were executed. Why? Where was Jesus? In the middle. In the center of messiness, the brokenness, the sin of our world and us, even on the cross, he still offered grace and forgiveness to the soldiers, for they knew not what they did, to his very own people who denied and drove him to this place and time, and to the one next to him, hanging in agony, asking for forgiveness. There were so many little things that were fulfilled that one could take all night pointing them out, and the prophecies that literally had been fulfilled. However, the most important one was yet again time. Jesus had to hang on the cross as the ultimate sacrifice for six hours on the day. The day of man, the duration of time from the first sacrificial lamb to the last becoming the sacrifice himself that would take away the sin from the world. He endured to make a bridge to cross the great divide from the sinful world to a life with him and the Father in paradise. When 3 p.m. PM came and the last lamb was slain, the priest lifted up his arms and said, It is finished! And the shofar blew. It was at that time that Jesus had endured it all. He lifted up his head and he said, It is finished. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. One, the guilt, the sin, the sacrifice, the atonement. He took all of that upon himself and endured the apportioned time, at which point he could, having said, completed it all. It is finished. At that moment, a huge earthquake rocked the land, and rocks were split open, and the dead came from their tombs and were seen by many. And the 60 foot long by 30 foot high and 4 inch thick veil separating the Holy of Holies and the temple was torn from top to bottom. The heavy golden doors that one had to open before the veil was set ajar, never to be shut again. And the scarlet cord that only miraculously turned white on Yom Kippur for one day, before it turned scarlet again, turned white permanently. Shabbat was quickly approaching. The bodies needed to be taken down. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus went into town to see Pilate and ask if they could have the body of Christ. Pilate granted their request. They took with them 70 pounds of spices to prepare the body. Before they got there, the soldiers, wanting to hurry up the process, took a hammer and broke the legs of the two prisoners on either side of Jesus. Without being able to push up from their feet to grasp air, they would suffocate shortly. When they came to Jesus, they saw he was already dead. So a spear was lifted up as prophesied and shoved into his side and only water poured out. He had literally bled every last drop. Now I'm in the minority on this, but with evidence and divine download, I truly believe that the biggest fulfillment happened out of sight. 
When the earthquake opened the rocks, Christ's blood flowed down the cross, down the rocks, and onto the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant that is buried below. You see, the sacrifice was not complete unless it was sprinkled on the mercy seat of the Ark. And I would argue, if God fulfilled every teeny, tiny detail on everything else, the one major act that had and needed to happen, I will say, did. The body of Christ was brought down, and scriptures say a tomb in a garden close by was brand new. It was Joseph of Arimathea, who was a very wealthy man. It was a very large tomb, one that had not yet been used. While we were there in Israel, this time we were taken to the place many believed could actually just be the tomb of Christ. And if not that one, one very similar in the same area. It was just, just east across the main road and a little south from where Jesus would have been crucified. The tomb was so large that our entire group fit in it, which could only come from the wealthiest of men. Besides, Jesus was only borrowing it anyway. That whirlwind of a 24-hour window, from singing and laughing and celebrating to intense teaching, fear, bewilderment, anger and torment, to pain and the most helpless feeling and now despair and the gut-wrenching pain and sadness, the huddled disciples could not humanly process all that had just transpired right before their eyes in a blink of an eye. Jesus' body was laid down on a cold, hard stone ledge in a cave but he wasn't there. He had already left in spirit to the fallen realm to proclaim the good news that he wasn't staying there. No, in three days, he would be back. Joseph and Nicodemus cleaned his body, but the time was getting short. Shabbat was approaching quickly, and they made their way out of the tomb and watched the soldiers Roll the stone across, sealed with pirate's ring and guards standing by. 